our great hope, a vaccine for coronavirus. But this is a whole new different kind of vaccine. Virus scientists have been working frantically to try to stop the deadly illness in its tracks. The team of Gabriel Australians is trying to develop a vaccine for the virus. The only thing that will really allow life as we once knew it to resume is a vaccine. Scientists around the world have joined an unprecedented global effort to create a COVID-19 vaccine. There's no race between those of us designing vaccines. The race is on for all of us against the virus. We've never seen this level of collaboration and cooperation. We've seen unusual bedfellows, the private sector, the public sector, science, medicine, everyone coming together. But there is no guarantee of success and the challenges, both scientific and ethical, are enormous. People need to appreciate that trying to develop a vaccine in the face of a pandemic is a bit like trying to do a Houdini trick where someone puts a bag over your head so you can't see. We need a systemic approach that actually means fair and equitable pricing at the end of the day on what should be a public good. It's very easy to criticise Big Pharma, but to be quite blunt, until someone comes up with an alternative, we have to go with what we've got. Tonight on Four Corners, the race for a remedy. With more than 100 in development, we investigate the global efforts to find a COVID-19 vaccine and the battle to ensure that if scientists are successful, it doesn't just go to the highest bidder. These days, the lights are always on in the molecular bioscience labs at the University of Queensland. Professor Paul Young is one of the leaders of the UQ team. And, and are we going to be able to incorporate those into uh, different white virus forms? He and his colleagues have spent nearly every waking moment since January working on their COVID-19 vaccine. It's been 24-7 essentially with everybody in the team working very hard to get to where we are currently as quickly as we can. So lots of weekends, in fact all weekends, and most evenings. There's been a lot of time spent together. I think we probably know each other better now than we, we ever have done. What has amazed me, even with the 24-7 load that the whole team is carrying, we're still buoyed, we're still excited. The program is still going forward with full enthusiasm from everybody. UQ's vaccine project is seen as the most advanced in Australia and the team is feeling the weight of responsibility to deliver. The pressure has been enormous. In normal vaccine development, you would have months to work some of these issues out. We've got days and weeks to do that instead. The pressure certainly is felt. The need for us to ensure that our vaccine does make it through uh, into, into um, clinical use is one that we feel almost every day. The UQ project is largely funded by the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI, a group co-founded by billionaire philanthropist Bill Gates. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus. In 2015, after the deadly Ebola outbreak in West Africa, Gates warned that a global pandemic was looming calling for an urgent overhaul of infectious disease research and vaccine development. CEPI was formally launched at the 2017 World Economic Forum with nearly half a billion dollars of investment. Everyone's taken a leap of faith to pull this together. Australia has contributed $14 million. 
CEPI was created based on concerns that people had about the global response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which I'm sure most people remember. And we didn't have vaccines that were ready to go at a time of great crisis, and many lives were lost as a consequence. So a group of global health experts, together with some people from the business community, got together to say, well, how can we prevent that kind of thing happening again? CEPI is chaired by Australian Jane Holton, a former secretary of the Department of Health. When she was appointed three years ago, one of her priorities was a project called Disease X, preparing for the next pandemic. What CEPI did was look around the world, um, thinking about this challenge of Disease X to see who the best partners would be. One of the Disease X projects CEPI funded was at the University of Queensland, where researchers were working on new technology which could be used in a pandemic. We signed up as a university and certainly as a group working on this particular pathogen issue. The whole idea of developing vaccines to Disease X and, and uh, being ready to deploy our particular technology for an, for an, an emerging threat. Chinese health authorities are still working to identify the virus behind a pneumonia outbreak in the central city of With $14 million Wuhan, from CEPI, the work was well underway when the first reports of a viral outbreak started coming out of Wuhan in China. China is battling a new and rapidly spreading respiratory virus. The number in the Chinese that... city of Wuhan may be a new type of coronavirus. So the agreement with CEPI provided funding for us to expand our uh, research team. So we, we essentially doubled, may have even been tripled the uh, size of the team so that we could move rapidly towards the development of the vaccine. So there are a number of candidates that we're funding as part of our work in relation to COVID-19 that actually haven't yet generated a vaccine for use in humans but it is cutting edge science. And so we have to go carefully because we don't want to do something which puts people at risk. The virus that causes COVID-19 is covered in distinctive spike proteins that it uses to infect cells. UQ's vaccine uses a genetically engineered protein like the spike from COVID-19, which the body recognises as an intruder and starts fighting. What makes it unique is the team's groundbreaking invention called a molecular clamp, which helps the spike hold its shape to more effectively mimic the structure of the virus surface. Our clamp is sort of like a bulldog clip that holds that together and ensures that the right protein in the right structure is presented to the immune system as a vaccine. It's a concept that's uh, been around for a little bit, but the way that they've done it is, is a world first. Tests on mice have shown increased antibodies in those given the vaccine. So the immunity generated by the UQ candidate in mice um, in the first test was astounding. So, it, you know, in mice, it's doing what we want. Uh, it's making the right kind of antibodies. And it was uh, a great joy. It brought a smile to a lot of people's faces, I think. While the results in mice are promising, this technology has never been used in humans. Only about 6% of vaccines that make it to clinical trials turn into commercial products. It may be a problem for the University of Queensland vaccine because it's a protein vaccine and not a live virus. We might end up with a vaccine which gives us really good antibody responses, which is what we'd like to see. But in the long run, the antibody doesn't last. And in a year's time, there's no antibody there and we become vulnerable to the virus again. Or we might be partially protected, but still able to spread the virus.
This is the CSIRO high-tech biosecurity lab in Geelong, one of the few facilities globally that can do advanced animal trials with dangerous pathogens. It's playing a critical role in the worldwide hunt to find a COVID-19 vaccine. Our facility is, is really uh, very um, rare in the world. There's only about half a dozen facilities of our type. Dr. Trevor Drew is the director of the lab. Our people dress up in a full suit with a, its own separate air supply. They come out of the laboratory and go through a chemical shower uh, in their suits. This is probably the highest level of containment uh, that exists anywhere in the world. Two international COVID vaccine teams funded by CEPI are relying on the facility to carry out animal testing. The uh, Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness has been working uh, on two different uh, vaccines, one from Inovio in the United States and another one from Oxford University in the UK. The Oxford University vaccine uses a harmless virus, usually found in chimpanzees, to carry the genetic code for the spike protein into the body to try and stimulate an immune response. This particular type of vaccine has never been licensed for widespread commercial human use. Look, my attitude is we should use everything at our disposal now to try and find a way out of the crisis that the globe is currently facing. And if that's new science, which uh, we are trying out, that's fine. What we have to do is to make sure that we test things properly, that we make sure they're safe and we make sure that they're effective. The CSIRO lab uses ferrets in its animal testing because they have similar respiratory systems to humans. Dr Drew's team injected the ferrets with the Oxford vaccine. But before all the animal testing was complete, you ready? Oxford announced it was starting phase one human trials. Okay, so I need a scratch. And when Oxford announced that they were starting their uh, phase one trials and we're thinking, we've only just immunized our ferrets, I'm going, wow. They know that both the ferrets and the monkeys had no adverse effects from the vaccine. So that's one step to move to humans. But I must say that is uh, certainly, again, this is new country and new territory. And there must have been a very strong case for them to actually allow that through. Now, I wasn't a party to any of those discussions, but uh, you can probably gather I'm actually, um, I'm actually nervous about this. But I also have a lot of faith in the checks and balances and the systems that we actually use. My personal reaction to the news that the Oxford University uh, uh, vaccine had moved to phase one clinical trials was actually one of uh, uh, huge respect and admiration uh, for the volunteers who have stepped forward and said, yes, we, we understand the risks, but uh, we're prepared to do this for, for humanity. It, it, uh, it is just awesome. People who are prepared to uh, put their lives on the line for uh, the furtherment of science and the, the development of this vaccine. The first phase one human trial in Australia of a potential vaccine began two weeks ago. At this Melbourne clinic, 
These volunteers were injected with a vaccine made by American company Novavax. It had already finished animal trials in the US. So phase one trial is really about confirming the safety in humans. And then what we do is progress to a phase two trial once that safety data stacks up and is uh, independently reviewed and we're completely happy that it's safe. And the, the phase two trial is still a little bit about safety, but starting to get more readouts on uh, efficacy. Normally, a phase one trial would take several months, but preparations for Novavax's phase two stage are already underway. If we get the safety signals that we need so that the vaccine is definitely safe, the, the phase two will start really quickly. So essentially around that six week mark, the, the green light will, will be there for the phase two and, and that'll start um, as well. So this is where being able to do things in parallel, as we've already talked about, cutting down the unnecessary time in the development process is our objective. It is not our objective to cut corners on safety. China is at the forefront of human trials, with five teams from biotechs and state institutions testing their vaccines. Can Sinobiologics, which has a similar vaccine to Oxford, announced promising results after successfully testing it on 108 volunteers. China doesn't have the best of reputation for making uh, pharmaceutical products. They had a big scandal with vaccines a couple of years ago where they were making vaccines which were not what they were supposed to be and weren't working. So that I would imagine that it, given China's current sensitivity about its role in the spread of the coronavirus, they're going to be very careful about making sure that any product that they produce is tested rigorously to make sure that it's safe. Now, I have great confidence in the global regulators. Um, they, more than anybody else, know the consequences of allowing a product for broad use if it is not safe. They have seen those cases. They remember them very, very well. And I am absolutely confident they do not want to see that happen. In America, some members of Congress are calling for a truly radical approach, so-called challenge trials in humans, in which volunteers would be given a potential vaccine and then deliberately infected with COVID-19 to see if it works. That is really going down a path where uh, not many people have gone before. I mean, I think that um, purposely challenging people uh, is, is going to be quite, quite a, a difficult thing to accept ethically. The deadly outbreak in 2003 of SARS, another type of coronavirus, should have been the world's wake-up call. With fears of a pandemic, scientists were tasked to come up with a vaccine. Adelaide's Flinders University was part of the global effort. It was difficult because we hadn't worked with coronaviruses before. We didn't really know, you know, can we make a vaccine against a coronavirus? You know, what part of the virus should we be targeting? So we were flying blind. Professor Nikolai Petrovsky's SARS vaccine work was funded by the National Institutes of Health in the United States. The research showed how unpredictable and slow vaccine development can be. There were some surprises, um, and the particular one that really set um, us back was that the initial vaccines that were developed were actually causing uh, the virus to become actually um, more lethal um, and, and making um, the animals, at least, uh, get sicker 
than the animals that had never received the vaccine. I mean, that's the worst possible outcome. Ultimately, we're able to show that, yes, we could fix that problem with our technology. And obviously, that took a number of years to get to that point. SARS died out, and in 2011, the US Health Department reallocated its funding to other areas. We were flawed, I mean, because, you know, a lot had been invested in SARS vaccine development to that date, not just in our program, but in all the programs. It would be in the hundreds of millions, if not billions. If we had continued to chase um, a SARS or MERS vaccine, um, we would be in a better position, there's no doubt. We could have done lots more work, yes. Looking back, we did warn everyone that we still believed coronaviruses were going to cause another big pandemic. Hi, Saski. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, the US National Institutes of Health has come back to Professor Petrovsky with new funding, and he's now restarted where he was 10 years ago. It's a sad reality that funding for um, preparedness in these areas runs on the cycle that we describe as being one of panic and then neglect. So that, that cycle of panic and neglect is something which those of us in the sector have watched now time and time again. And it is sadly the case that many projects that had promise were defunded uh, because priorities moved elsewhere. Leading scientists say failure to adequately fund infectious disease research has impacted Australia's ability to respond to a pandemic. Eight positions in biosecurity research at the Geelong Lab were lost in 2014 after the Abbott government cut $111 million from CSIRO's budget. The lab's team was gradually rebuilt and two months ago the federal government announced a $220 million upgrade of the facility. But construction work won't start for two years. In around 2014, there were some significant cuts to CSIRO which impacted on the uh, research capability of ACDP. The facility, ACDP, is, is now 35 years old. Uh, it hit, had a projected lifespan uh, of 100 years, but of course it's a bit like a, 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 a broom that's uh, lasted for that length of time with five new handles and three new heads. Uh, it's something that we need to constantly do, is to uh, replace and repair elements of the facility. The teams at Flinders and UQ say they were forced to conduct their animal testing overseas because the CSIRO lab was so in demand. Unfortunately, they went ahead with two vaccines from overseas that essentially used up the capacity. So we had to pivot quite quickly and, uh, and uh, look for an alternative source of uh, animal testing. Funding cuts and the reorganisation of funding has been very challenging for us. Basically, you know, scientists in the area, this area, were uh, vaccine manufacture and, and virology in particular, you know, very dispirited, very disheartened. Uh, we've seen our teams dissolve, disperse, expertise go overseas because, you know, the funding just wasn't able to sustain uh, the work or a salary for any of those people. So, yeah, we, I think we've lost a lot of capability over the, the last couple of years. As researchers, we always spend a disproportionate amount of our time simply trying to raise the necessary funds to do our work. Um, one of the good things that's come out of this pandemic for those of us working in this area is that we have been able to receive funds. And I guess we only wish that some of these, had, some of these funds had been available earlier. So, uh, to my mind, being able to see a regular level of funding being committed to preparedness is the priority. And uh, if we can come out of this experience with a greater focus on that need, I think we'll be all the better for it. Since the pandemic, UQ's vaccine team has received $15 million from state and federal governments. 
And last week, Canberra announced a further $13.6 million for COVID-19 vaccine development in Australia. Research in Australia is horribly underfunded. So there's absolutely no doubt we don't fund uh, basic research enough. It's out of that basic research that we are able to develop the strategies to combat these large pandemics. One of the concerns I have, and I, I, I fear it's almost inevitable, as soon as this pandemic is over, as soon as the attention goes away from it, we will go back to the way we were in terms of funding. And so we will end up in, a, um, in a, having a research base that again is not as well suited to respond as it perhaps could do. development of new medical products around the world is led by private industry, with just a handful of major pharmaceutical companies dominating the market. For companies, vaccines are not an attractive proposition. Uh, they, they cost a lot to develop, they're risky, they require significant clinical trials, so for a lot of companies it's not worth the effort. There are many pathogens that are potentially quite risky for human populations. But sadly, because there isn't a market for any uh, vaccines or therapeutics in respect of those, uh, those pathogens, obviously there's limited amounts of work done on them. The pharmaceutical industry has a long tradition of putting profits over people. Some examples of that, for instance, are they won't produce medicines that for neglected tropical diseases because simply the people who are affected by those diseases aren't wealthy enough to pay the price that they would be demanding for those drugs. The consequences of leaving it up to the market were demonstrated in the Ebola outbreak in 2014 in West Africa. <laughs> a potential vaccine had proven effective in animals almost a decade earlier, but no company had been willing to invest in its development. So when the Ebola outbreak uh, occurred, Nothing was ready. There were no doses available. There was no knowledge as to whether or not the vaccine was safe or effective. Now, eventually the vaccine was developed, it was tested, and it did have a role to play in the initial outbreak. But many healthcare workers, frontline workers, and people living in West Africa lost their lives when it turns out that the vaccine could have played an important role in, in tamping down the outbreak at a very early stage. Our current system is very much industry-focused, patent protection on everything return on investment and long development times that have to be paid for. Professor Ian Fraser is behind one of Australia's most famous vaccine success stories. In 1991, he and his colleague discovered the technology behind the HPV vaccine that prevents 90% of cervical cancer. All Australian teenagers are now offered the vaccine. OK, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> Eventually, not in my lifetime, but sometime in my children's lifetime, I think we will be able to say that we've eradicated cervical cancer. The intellectual property on Fraser's breakthrough was licensed to pharmaceutical companies, CSL and then Merck. It went on to become one of the world's most expensive vaccines, earning Merck billions of dollars. Hold up. The vaccine has only recently become more accessible in developing countries, which is predicted to save millions of lives. This vaccine has been incredibly profitable to the companies that have sold it, but also then incredibly difficult for people to access. Cervical cancer is, is one of the leading causes of death for, for women in, in developing countries. Uh, I, I think approximately uh, 270,000 women uh, die each year. Uh, and so the uh, unaffordability and the lack of availability of this vaccine, whether due to high prices or insufficient manufacturing capacity, 
uh, it leads to this direct consequence of large numbers of women uh, sort of continuing to be vulnerable to developing HPV and eventually to cervical cancer. Look, I, I have to be honest and say that I realize that uh, big pharma doesn't exist for any purpose other than to make money for its shareholders. And if we didn't have big pharma, we wouldn't have a papillomavirus vaccine. It's very easy to criticize big pharma, but to be quite blunt, until someone comes up with an alternative, we have to go with what we've got. I think that uh, what we've learned from that is that if we're developing a vaccine which is going to be a public health measure across the planet, we have to think at the start about how we're going to actually make that possible. When it comes to big production of uh, billions of doses, that is not something that you do in a university lab. So this is why we need this partnership between research and really experienced manufacturers. I'm really pleased that the big multinationals have already indicated that they will partner with us uh, to work together in a way that is unprecedented and that they will actually produce vaccine um, at the cost of goods, that it actually, what it actually costs to produce. Every vaccine team funded by CEPI has to commit to making their technology available in a fair and equitable manner. But CEPI won't confirm if the vaccines they fund will be patented and who will own them. We have what we call um, our equitable access policy and all of the people who that we work with uh, have signed on to our equitable access policy. They understand that that is the basis on which we provided funding. But we're not usually the sole funder, so there is a negotiation to be gone through. What I can tell you is the crucial thing here is that vaccines are made widely available, that they're made available to people who need them first and most, and that they're made available at a price that is affordable. The devil is in the details. What does the agreement actually say about equitable access, about pricing for drugs, about making sure that they're distributed on need, not by distributing to the country that has the most power in the room or who has the most incentive to keep the pharmaceutical industry happy? No amount of philanthropy or altruism is going to solve this problem. We need a systemic approach that actually means fair and equitable pricing at the end of the day on what should be a public good. One of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies is GlaxoSmithKline, or GSK. Last year, they made a profit of nearly $13 billion. And they are currently working on their own COVID-19 vaccine. GSK has publicly declared that uh, of all the collaborations we have with partners around COVID vaccines that we don't intend to make profit during the pandemic uh, phase. GSK says once the initial pandemic is over, it sees a COVID-19 vaccine as a commercial product. Yes, companies will make money from this. That's why they're uh, in existence. And uh, I suppose in one sense, a coronavirus vaccine will be a blockbuster. The university is not going to take any royalties or license fee for the, for the um, um, intellectual property that's uh, bound up in the molecular clamp for this particular vaccine. And so we're definitely committed to that equitable access. There is a potential for this to be a commercial product uh, after this initial uh, wave of, uh, of a pandemic. Uh, certainly our, our technology is a platform technology, so it can be applied to a large number of viruses. Medicine Sans Frontier is on the front line of the COVID response. It's calling on companies and institutions not to patent any vaccines or treatments. They need to come to the table and give, give us access to their science, to their production, to their formulations for the vaccines that they're producing, for the treatments that they're producing, so that they can then be mass produced at the scale that we need and at the price point that we need. 
The United States has been largely absent from international efforts to coordinate the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, pouring billions into its own program called Operation Warp Speed. That means big and it means fast. Operation Warp Speed is a new program by the United States government which is seeking to sort of accelerate the development of a new vaccine as quickly as possible. So you really get the sort of um, rupture between uh, what the United States does, which has you know, the most capital, the most resources, the most science, and really what the rest of the world is trying to do collectively. And, and that eventually is going to come to a real uh, flashpoint. Any vaccine that's manufactured by the large pharma companies in the United States, I do not see how a single dose of vaccine will be exported or be allowed to be exported until that whole domestic market is satisfied, which may take two or three years. There's nothing to stop a country banning the export of product manufactured in that country, so that's their, their right. What we don't want to see is a level of vaccine nationalism where countries basically uh, are not prepared to contribute to the global effort. And the best thing we can do at the moment is advocate for that, to advocate that actually if there's any of this disease anywhere in the world, it's in nobody's interest. In 2009, during the swine flu pandemic, Australia's CSL Limited was one of the first to invent a vaccine. A prior agreement with the federal government required CSL to first supply Australia with enough vaccine to protect its population before selling it to anybody else. What it really points to is we have to have binding fair agreements that all countries can rely upon. And if that doesn't occur, every government will behave in the exact way that Australia did at that time, because at the end of the day, governments will look out for the needs of their own citizens first, knowing that every other government might act in the exact same way if they happen to have a vaccine. We worry about export control. We know that export controls have occurred in areas where there is high demand and I think we would be naive if we didn't expect that there is a risk that that might happen in relation to vaccine. So we need to take steps and we're taking those steps to ensure that production is globally diversified and that is our objective. CSL has committed to manufacturing UQ's vaccine if it's successful. But Australia's capacity to produce other types of potential COVID-19 vaccines is limited. So fortunately for the um, University of Queensland vaccine, it's a fairly generic platform. Uh, so the kind of facilities that CSL have produced would work for that, a protein subunit vaccine. But if it turns out that it's a DNA or particularly an RNA vaccine, you know, we might be really struggling to manufacture that at the level needed. In 2017, a Defence Department report warned that Australia's vaccine manufacturing capacity was low and the capability to upscale production was a major weakness. The recent report suggesting that we need more vaccine development infrastructure, I can only agree with. I think that we have to accept that for most of our vaccines at the moment, with the exception of the flu vaccine, come from overseas. And that puts us in a very vulnerable position when borders are closed. We actually should be investing now in greater vaccine manufacturing capacity around the world. And I think that idea has significant merit. I mean, we know that at times we need more vaccine to be produced than we might need on a regular basis. While work on a new vaccine continues, scientists are testing to see if anything that's already on the shelf could help. One very old vaccine is now being trialled in the new fight against COVID-19. It just takes a while because it's intradermal. Yeah, sure. It's just The BCG vaccine is nearly 100 years old, and it is a vaccine that was created um, to protect against tuberculosis or TB. 
the BCG vaccine doesn't just prevent tuberculosis. Professor Nigel Curtis has spent much of the past decade studying the impact it has on our immune systems. The really extraordinary and exciting thing about this vaccine is that it also enhances the immune system in a very generalised way. In studies in Guinea-Bissau, a country with very high mortality in babies and in children, it was observed that those who'd had the BCG vaccine had a much better survival. And the increased survival was not due to reduced deaths from tuberculosis, but reduction in deaths from the other infections that kill young children in high mortality settings, such as pneumonia and sepsis and diarrhoea. Well, I think D7 you, is the one. Can you see that I didn't do a cell count there? The World Health Organization is now backing a trial to see if the BCG vaccine could help protect healthcare workers against COVID-19. A study of this size would generally take up to a year to plan and set up, but we managed to get this trial going in 20 days from first meeting to design the trial to recruiting our first participant. We're hoping that by using this property of the vaccine, we can enhance the immune system of healthcare workers so that when they're exposed to the coronavirus, they get less severe disease. The trial involves 10,000 healthcare workers in Australia, Spain and the Netherlands. It hasn't received any federal government funding, but the Gates Foundation has donated $10 million. Okay, so it's going in your left arm to get you to yep. hook your top up. Now it does sting a little bit because it's just going onto the skin. Yeah, sure. So. Right. Yeah. One, two, three. Okay, well done. Now we're just going to take a photo. Okay. Until we've had a chance to look at this properly, it's way too early to conclude that BCG vaccine provides any protection against coronavirus. And it's very important that we don't lose sight of these tried and tested methods. Despite the fact there is an urgency to getting results that we can use for this pandemic, unless we do trials and um, experiments properly, we're in danger of getting the wrong result. Today, the first human trial in the Southern Hemisphere officially begins oh, in Melbourne. Progress on the vaccine front, particularly. But says results from other clinical trials will continue to narrow the field. At the University of Queensland, Professor Paul Young and the team are preparing to take their vaccine to the next level. Human trials are due to start in July. I think Professor Paul Young must be feeling quite anxious at the moment because, of course, he'd, a lot of people are expecting that the vaccine is going to work and we don't know yet. And let me just say from our perspective, there's no, there's no race between those of us designing vaccines. The race is on for all of us against the virus and we'd be happy to see any other vaccine reach a point where it can make a difference in, in the global community. Um, I suspect that one vaccine is not going to be enough to vaccinate the entire world. So we will need a, a, a multi-pronged attack on this. So um, the more of us that uh, get to that end point of being able to deliver at scale a uh, workable vaccine, the better. But scientists warn that the chance of success is slim and that the world might have to learn to live with COVID-19. I think by nature, uh, most people who are scientists uh, in, in research labs around the place are conservative. So generally we're not um, over, overstating uh, the, the results that are coming through. You know, we, we're optimistic and we think that we've got um, enough irons in the fire to solve the problem, but we certainly don't want to give false hope. I do think it's important to remind ourselves when it comes to the optimism that many of us feel that there's never been a vaccine produced for a coronavirus. We still don't have a vaccine for HIV. And even though we've now got treatments, which is fantastic, we don't have a vaccine uh, for HIV. So it is worth remembering that there are areas where people have invested 
billions of dollars to try and find an answer and to date that they, ha they have not.